So it's my pleasure to introduce the craft and the craft concept and craft methods and the projects that are based on the theory of the craft concept. And the title of my presentation from the theory to the practice, and I'm going to introduce a new way of urban and regional development. Uh, so let's start with a theory, but don't worry, it will be very short. Uh, uh, we pay attention on the creativity, innovation, and sustainability in the craft concept. And the first slide shows how we interpret the uh, creativity. So people who are able to make new things or gathering new ideas, and uh, we create something new that never existed before. For us, uh, this is the main meaning of creativity, and the creativity goes along with the innovation as well. So the innovation is the process. It translates the idea we generated into certain product services or other solutions. And it's very important that these product services provide added value for the stakeholders as well, as well as we have customers who are ready to pay for these products. And the innovation can be evolutionary innovation and revolutionary innovation. Here you can see some short description and the difference uh, between these two notions. And there are other typology regarding innovation. The innovation can be related to certain products, can be related to certain processes, how we make these processes more effective. It can be related to certain marketing solutions to find the best channel to the final customers, as well to the organization, so we can launch new organization change and we can get a more modern form of organization. But my favorite is this matrix because of being an engineer as well, so engineers prefer to get always two-dimensional matrices, and this matrix has two dimensions. The first is the, if the domain are well-defined or not, and the second describes whether the problem is well-defined or not, and in case of both uh, a high level definition, we can speak about a sustaining innovation. In other cases, we just talk about uh, breakthrough innovation or disruptive innovation, or in some cases, we just do basic researches. So the craft, not only a collection of definitions, but a concept as well, and there are lots of concepts in the social sciences that analyze individuals, smaller groups like families, or bigger groups like groups in workplaces, and even more bigger groups like nations. But in this concept or approach, uh, something is missing, and this is the so-called cooperation. And the center of attention of the craft concept is the cooperation among participants, among, among individuals, among groups, and among universities, organizations, non-profit, for-profit organizations as well. So the traditional approach of regional development is that we just concentrate, I don't know, road construction or building reconstruction, but we don't put uh, these elements into a big system. And in the craft concept, we first design the main system, and then we select some elements, and in addition to the development of these subsystems, we try to increase the effectiveness of the cooperation among these uh, subsystems as well. So the craft is nothing else than an abbreviation of creative cities, sustainable regions, and is a, in our understanding, is an innovative regional development concept, is an integrated framework, as you see in the slide, and we just set up long and medium term goals, how to develop certain regions or cities and their neighborhoods uh, together. Very important is the transdisciplinarity, is a very challenging word to pronounce, and we try to take advantage of different approaches, different sciences, and in craft center, uh, social scientists, economists, uh, big data experts and other experts uh, work together with sustainability experts and it means the sustainability is to find the synergy of these different disciplines. 
So if you would like to read more in the corridor, Salam, there are some new books and uh, other books. I would like to suggest the basic book in English language with the same title, Creative City Sustainable Regions. Or in Hungarian, there are some essays and the first results of the practice-oriented craft projects, as well as we published, we have published recently this book, The Renaissance of Small Cities in Hungarian Language. But craft is not only a concept and a theory, but uh, it's also uh, a model in which we have to set up a creative space. And the creative space means, oh, there are some graphical problem here, uh, to realize the triple helix model in which universities and research institutes, like for instance, IASC and University of Pannonia, uh, working together with the local municipality, local government, as uh, Mr. Laszlo Hubert mentioned here in the opening speech, as well as the representatives of business sector. And we are approaching the practical application uh, our main goal is to contribute to the regional development and set up new strategies for region who would like to be more developed. And for this, uh, we make, uh, made a literature review and we found lots of concepts. For instance, I have to mention here the creative and smart city concepts. And we divided this concept into three main categories, as you see here. But this can be related to big cities, big size cities. In some cases, like in global indexes, uh, can be related to and applied for uh, capitals of different countries. But for a small city like Kursag, it's not applicable. So we try to find a new solution. And the inventor and creator of the craft concept, uh, Professor Mitzliw, has formulated this triangle in which we try to discover potentials in the region like creativity and innovation potential, social capital and network potential, as well as sustainability potential. So we always measure and assess the potential already existing in a certain region and we try to uh, set up the strategy based on these given potentials. And we apply in this concept the new way of strategic planning of companies, multinational companies, which starts with the definition of mission statement and vision statement. Very important is the vision statement when we describe the ideas, future state of the organization. And then we set up strategic goals, which in the organizational theory can be related to certain customers, financial issues, internal processes, and learning and growth. And the next step of the traditional way is to set up organization as short-term plans. But we don't want to follow one by one this model. Instead, we would like to select some strategic goals for the region in these key areas. And each of these target areas, we set up potential development projects for the region. So it makes this regional development process very goal-oriented, as well as very uh, effective. And we try to avoid any rigid strategic and operational plans. So it's a very flexible model. And if we change only the content of the strategic goals of companies, and we would like to apply it for regions and cities, we just change some content, as you see here. So instead of products, we are talking about public goods and so on. And we can get the model for regional development uh, uh, concept uh, in a new way. And how we work it with regions and cities, first we try to describe the present state of the region of the city using a special assessment and measurement tool, which we call craft index. And then, together with the decision makers, we set up the vision. The vision for a region can be a historic region when we would like to uh, increase uh, the importance of cultural heritage or tourism as a destination. Uh, or we rely on the newest technology and we imagine this region as a very modern, smart region. Or we rely on the artistic value and we would like to create a region of arts. So in any cases, we are able to describe with numbers the present state of the region as well as the future state of the region. How we do it, 
we created the craft index. And the craft index consists of hard and soft indicators. Hard indicators are uh, indicators from already existing databases. Uh, soft indicators when we launch a survey and we ask the local residents or uh, representatives of companies or NGOs and so on. So we collect original data. Uh, these are the soft indicators. Uh, when we create the CAFT index, in every region, every city, we measure a certain amount of indicators. These are the core indicators. And uh, in other regions, or from regions by regions, we change some indicators because some of them are relevant in one region but not so relevant in other region. Or there are special needs from the municipality, for instance, what information and what knowledge they would like to gather so we can put other special indicators into the craft index. And the craft index, looking at the content, can be related from the basic needs through governance and uh, health problems, uh, uh, through culture and network and cooperation. So we defined eight uh, areas uh, in which we try to uh, uh, generate these indicators. And how does it work in the practice? So we create and calculate this craft indicator, which is a very complicated indicator, uh, generating these values for each of these indicators. And together with the decision makers, local decision makers, we set up the strategy for the future. So we define the ideal future values of these indicators. So, and we arrived to the practice, and Kraft works uh, and runs as a network. Uh, we took advantage of the fact that the University of Pannonia has got, in the Pannon region, different campuses in different uh, cities, and we set up Kraft points. So, the headquarter is in Kösek, but we have Kraft point in Vesprim, in Kassai. Here you see the location for foreigners who doesn't know very well the geography of Hungary. And so we cover the so-called panel region and these craft points organize event or uh, uh, work as a consultant for local municipalities and they carry out empirical surveys as well. So uh, we have completed uh, some practical projects recently as well and I highlighted it blue letters to uh, very important projects. The first is running in Vesprim. So here you see the location of Vesprim. Vesprim is one of the uh, candidates, or strongest candidate for the uh, cultural capital of Europe in the near future. And we just started the uh, uh, assessment of uh, the potential uh, in Vesprim and the neighborhood of Vesprim. And we are in strong cooperation regarding the empirical survey with the uh, Sonda Ipsos, the police uh, organization in Hungary. They are collecting, they uh, have been collecting uh, data uh, about West Bremen and its neighborhood. And hopefully in the near future, I hope in September, end of September, we can launch a new project in the Yashag region. You can see the location of the Yashag region and it's a very complicated region with uh, lots of development potential. And uh, they ask us to use the craft concept and the craft method in order to develop their long-term development strategies. And it's a region which consists of five cities and 13 villages. And uh, we hope that uh, in a half a year to one year project, we will be able to design the new development strategy for this region. Uh, we carried out um, scholarship program is a scholarship program in the last years, two scholarship programs, and more than 130 researchers from more than 15 countries arrived here. You can get the abstract of each of the researches in English language, uh, uh, hopefully in the corridor. And uh, uh, Professor, uh, the mayor, uh, Mr. Laszlo Huber, mentioned some uh, construction or reconstruction project regarding the uh, buildings and their cultural heritage. And this is the old picture of the Zwinga Tower. It was to go for a walk and just visit the uh, uh, renovated building. Or some pictures uh, about the uh, running projects like the House of Balls, the synagogue project. Uh, or if you go uh, 
uh, to the corner uh, where the Europe House is, you can see the House of Arts under construction or the Benedictine Monastery. And the main dream is to renovate the uh, main building. It used to be an orphanage of the Hungarian Railways. And here you see the old pictures about this building and our dream to create a really physically creative space there. So you see this is the design of the building and it's very interesting that there are different wings or parts of the building which are connected to uh, tubes and in each of the tubes we designed balls and within the balls we imagined lecturing rooms, a very innovative lecture rooms as well as libraries and a beautiful park around this uh, part of the conference is the Brook Review. We uh, published two uh, books recently about the newest uh, results of the craft project, and this will be part of the conference after, uh, if I know it correctly, after this session. So this is just an overview about the projects and the concept we uh, have been working on. And if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask me in the break. Uh, I'm ready to answer these questions. Thank you very much for your attention. So let's uh, move on with the session. Uh, so Lush's uh, uh, presentation was about the craft project and the craft concept in general. But, uh, and many of us already know the craft uh, project and the activities. But I was just uh, listening to the presentation. I, uh, I had the feeling that this is evolving meantime, so even I have new ideas when I listen to presentations about the craft project and the craft concept. So this is something which is going on. Many of the activities we have uh, already covered what was introduced already, but there is a lot uh, which is still ahead of us uh, in Kursag or the other cities of, uh, of the region. Now, uh, the next couple of presentations and this first session in general uh, considers the role of business uh, in general in local and regional development. Now, this is not uh, by coincidence, uh, because the, uh, the work we do at the uh, craft center at the moment uh, will consider the role of businesses in the Kursag region, in the West Prim region, and in the other regions uh, mentioned already. So what we are, and I will introduce this uh, work in a, in a few minutes uh, in a bit more detail, but what we are looking at now is how small businesses, medium or large businesses, uh, can contribute to regional development. So this is the reason why we invited a couple of uh, quite well-known uh, researchers from, from Europe and uh, all around the world. Um, and we will start with Professor Rafael Sarda, who is uh, uh, coming from Barcelona. Uh, I will give you the word to introduce yourself in a bit more detail, but he has various, uh, very interesting backgrounds, and we've been working together for, for quite some years. Um, he's from ESADA, uh, one of the best business schools in, in, in Europe, I should say, and uh, he will tell us about his uh, ideas and concepts about business, society, and the environment. Please. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Rafael. I just tried to, to change the cover because I wanted to put this band. And in fact, in fact I, I, I give it to you, but uh, because we have been uh, affected by the terrorist attack the other day, so I tried to put this band on, on this cover, but uh, unfortunately it's not there. But we suffered the attacks, and uh, I just uh, want to express the gratitude to people that helped in the, in, in in this terrorism attack on Barcelona the other day. Well, my name is Rafael Sardá. I'm representing. Uh, as uh, Jula said, also I'm working in the National Council of Research in Spain, so I have uh, my, my main background is uh, sociologist, and I work in, in two domains at the same time, in social science and natural science, being couple doing things uh, in the borderline. Uh, recently, with uh, my friend Stefano, that is going to talk uh, after me, and another top executive of United Nations, uh, we are producing a book on this particular issue, and this, brief in this will be a kind of brief introduction to a new concept on corporate sustainability in these days, which is a kind of business in nature concept. And uh, for those of you that are going in to be in the summer school tomorrow, uh, we will continue, we will evolve on this issue uh, with the approach of energy and climate tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So just going on, on this particular topic, uh, 
let's do a kind of timeline of what has been uh, the corporate sustainability issue in the next, in the coming 50 years. It took us uh, 100,000 years to, to men to realize almost that uh, we are here in a planet which is a little bit finite. Uh, so uh, we, we need to think in, a, in another way we, we used to do in, in the past. But it was until uh, 50 years ago that we realized that, uh, well, man is in the planet and it can affect the planet in many, many issues and it can affect the planet in a negative way too. So uh, in, the 50, in the 50s, 60s, we start to change the way in which we approach the environment. Uh, and there were some, some books that uh, help us to realize that we have some local problems, so we have some local pollution problems, and uh, we needed to change the mindset. Uh, but it was uh, around 30 years ago that uh, we came up with this sustainable development paradigm, and this changed a little bit everything, because in a way it produced a lot of tools and a lot of thinking and a lot of new ideas about globalization and how the men can add and can globalize this, these issues. But, uh, and there was a lot of books about how to, to approach the issue of uh, the sustainable development in practice, which, by the way, for, for me, this is sustainability, the way in which you approach this paradigm in practice. Uh, but it was uh, at the end, at the turn of the century, when United Nations came up with uh, new ideas through the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, the report, big report, in which uh, they start to... To, to see that uh, both things, the social issues and the environmental issues, need to be combined if we want to, to solve this issue of sustainable development. And we came up into a kind of new paradigm, the paradigm that everything needs to be integrated, everything needs to be coordinated in this social ecological paradigm. So coming to the approach uh, of practicing sustainable development in corporations, that is the idea of corporate sustainability, we started around 30 years, uh, more than 30 years ago, with this definition that is 40 years old, so it's, it's an old definition, and with the idea that uh, we, could, uh, we could improve the shareholder value management of companies if we took the issue about diminishing the risk or uh, uh, having opportunities to solve the issues that we have negatively created. So that was the first, the first idea of corporate sustainability. At that time, we were just using the concept of uh, the impact, the way in which uh, we are impacting or we were impacting these social ecological systems. And uh, the idea was just to try to equalize this impact into the future, try to maintain this impact. That was the thinking of. Uh, of us 40 years ago, and we were just working with these three factors for equalizing the impact, population, affluence, and technology. It's an old equation that was been, has been very famous in the literature, and we were just introducing these aspects into business about how to, to go into the clean production, how to, to try to, to reach environmental standards. That was uh, around 40 years ago. A second, a second pass uh, was produced in the 90s when uh, the big World Business Council of Sustainable Development, uh, John Elkington, started to, to, to talk about the efficiency, started to talk about the integration of social, economical, and environmental aspects, the triple bottom line. Uh, all these aspects changed the way in which we, we were trying to see corporate sustainability. There were new definitions. There are thousands of definitions of corporate sustainability. Everyone has, has its own one, but that was, uh, that was famous. And to try to manage this, what is called the triple bottom line, which is basic uh, what mostly, uh, most of the companies are doing today. Try to integrate these three aspects as far as they can and uh, trying to, 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 this, to come up with these win-win-win solutions that uh, has been famous in, in literature. Sometimes uh, we, we, we teach a lot in, in, in seminars, some blog seminars, and we are approaching many corporations. And uh, two years ago, we were with Stefan also in, in, a, in a conference in Cologne, and one big, big chemical company came up and did his speech, and he talked about the definition for sustainability for them. And they say, well, the, for us, sustainability is to to come up with solutions that enhance at least two of these issues and do not harm more the other th the third one. And when you say do not harm more the other one, the third one is this is the environment. Normally, this is the natural one. Huh? And the problem is, or the problem starts when, well, the situation today is not the good one. 
So if you don't have, you still continue with a situation that is not the best that you, you, should, you, should, you should come at. So, uh, and of course, and after that, we were just thinking about the efficiency, life, life cycle thinking. This is the main tools you have in practice these days in corporate sustainability. So the idea is, uh, well, this is enough. Uh, this is enough if we are just going for the uh, triple bottom line or we want to refine the way which we are putting shareholder value. And uh, we, we think not. We think this is not enough. And uh, a different mindset is needed. And this is why um, we are trying to pass this concept of the business in nature. I'm going, I'm going to give it to you. And why? Why? Because uh, global change. We, you have... The, I, I'm going to, to, to put like uh, six big messages that we have today. The world in which we live is about these six big messages. And what is global change? Well, global change is this one. Global change is a lot of exponential growth going on at the same time. Everything is getting accelerated. Everything is getting in, in percentage that increase and increase and increase. This comes from a 20, 30 years panel of experience in research. It comes from the International Geosphere Biosphere Program. So we know that, that, that these patterns have been with us for years. And we still are in these patterns. And it's, it's difficult to escape from that. So, but this is driving the way in which man is, is, is using and utilizing the Earth. Huh? So we live in a planet in a constant accelerated global change. Everything is connected. Everything is connected. We are connected every, through everything, but the flux of materials, goods, uh, information technology, our kids are connected everywhere. Uh, we were talking in the breakfast that my girlfriends, I my girlfriends, my, my girls can have boyfriends just for internet. And so everything is completely connected these days. We live in this planet and we need to, we need to know that this is an important, an important issue going on in relation with all the mega trends that affect this these days. On the other side, science is sending a clear message. As a, as a natural sign, this is a clear message. We have limits. We have these planetary boundaries. We have limits. We are passing these limits in biodiversity, in climate change, in the way we use nutrients. And we are approaching situations and we are crossing thresholds. And these thresholds are going to be with us. And we are going to approach in a dangerous world because of that. Huh? And because of the repercussions that this has on the social systems that uh, we are just, as society, living in. And in addition, we have this percentage of population. Population is growing 1% steadily. And uh, that means that we need to open room for the guys that are coming, and open room for a new middle class, and open room for many other people that want to consume as, as we are consuming right now. And we have only one entire planet, as you probably know. In addition, uh, we have this non-resilient social and ecological system, and there are plenty of NGOs that are approaching these days with a lot of reports saying that the world is not going in the good direction for those things. And uh, coming about uh, corporations and, and business and profits, we, need to, we are forced to grow 30% because if not, we are entering in a crisis. So, all things together send us a kind of message that uh, we need to accommodate the way in which we do things these days a little bit different of the way in which we have been done this in the, in the past. And this is not just a message from science or a message from social scientists, a message from uh, natural social scientists that are sending a message, but the United Nations is also claiming, and it's also claiming for, uh, for better, better understanding of what should be the relationship between business and the world. And uh, it produced this kind of uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, the thing is that, that was a very brilliant idea, uh, the, the way in which you, they could put these this sustainable development goals into icons and then make a representation of something that is needed. And it, it is capturing the attention of, of business. So this is the why we need something else. And we came up with the, with the idea that uh, we, we need to come back to one of the issues that was just highlighted back into, into the 60s in the, in the Brutland Report. It was there, it was there, it was there, it was written, which is that whatever we do, we try to maintain, we need to maintain the integrity of our natural systems, uh, because they are in relation with social systems, but we, uh, we need to maintain the integrity of this natural system because we need to, to ensure that the provision of ecosystem goods and services for the future Will, will be maintained with us. 
and with us as a people or as a corporation. So we, come, we came up with this idea to uh, define, we are just defining a little bit more on this concept, uh, of this concept of business in nature, which is, uh, okay, we need to go a little bit farther of what we have been doing these, these days on, on uh, corporate sustainability. Hmm? So uh, the what, I'm uh, going very rapidly, but uh, the, there are people that are just trying to follow these measures. There are people, there are several uh, big guys in top corporations that they are putting uh, a kind of commitments, they are putting kind of target, they are putting kind of strategies that trying to do not harm so much the way in which uh, they, they use nature because they are completely interdependent in the business and nature, the way in which you use nature for their own purpose. So they need to, to go into, into this line. And this is uh, what uh, they are trying to manage this beam business. And just to explain a little bit, because we'll, as I told you, we have just 15 minutes now, but uh, we, 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 will, we will work a little bit in, this, in the summer school with this concept tomorrow. Uh, what means business in nature? You have been just talking before uh, as, uh, the concept of a city. A city can be a social ecological system. You can put the boundaries, you can define the social ecological system you want to operate. A city like this one or like the mega region you, 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 uh, you just described the, the, in, the previous, in the previous talk, you can define your social ecological system and this social ecological system you have two subsystems, the social one and the natural one. In the social one, you have you and what you do. This is very clear to understand you and what you do. And this is clear understanding by, by, by business. In the natural system, we have exactly the same, but it's not correctly understand, understood, which is we have the units of nature, but also the, what these units are doing for us, the function of these units. And there is a complete connection between the two subsystems in a way that we are impacting, normally impacting negatively the natural system, but sometimes we, we, we try to impact positively the natural system. We create these pressures and pulses that are impacting, impacting the system. And as a consequence, we have something that is coming back from nature, these ecosystem goods and, suffers, that ecosystem goods and services that suffers a lot. So this relation between activities, impacts, effects, consequences, and response is, uh, we were talking with, uh, I, don't, I don't remember the name, but the, the guy that took the first, the, first, uh, the, the boss. Uh, yeah. We were talking when we, we are coming, coming here the, this morning about, this is the language that normally corporations have in, on the table. But when you come, you go with, uh, with natural scientists and you work on a similar table, and this is a problem we, you, you, you can recognize, we, everyone have. Uh, we talk about drivers, pressures, states, welfare, response. We use a different language. So the first thing that we need to, to try to do is to come, in, to come up with a kind of similar language to understand each other. Because sometimes what the, you talk about impact is understood by impact by, in a different way by, 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 other, by others. But anyway, we, have, we work with this system, and we work in this way. And uh, in corporations, many times, corporations are here, business are there, and many times you close this idea of business in society, and you don't realize that it's something else. Society lives in nature. So when you are approaching your, your, your business, you need to understand that there is a complete interdependence of business that doesn't end just with societies. There is a complete interdependence with business, with nature too. So this is basically the concept of, of business in nature, just to try to, to come up with something, with, with some solutions uh, as a whole. Okay, so we, we need to, to come back from, uh, from the impacts to the effects. This, this is uh, sometimes the, something that we, we need to understand very clearly. The problem we have these days is not about the impact as it was 40 years ago that we cause on the environment. The problem we have these days is that the effects that these impacts are producing are changing the world. And we, as a companies, we as, a, as a people too, but as a companies we are talking about corporate sustainability, we need to realize that we need to drive our targets on the effects. And the legislation is moving into the efforts. I, my, part of my responsibilities are just to, to 
come up with new new regulation. And if we talk, for example, of how climate, we are going to talk about climate. Climate, the regulation of climate is 450 ppm, two degrees. This is the effort, the state of nature we want. And this is what is driving regulation. And business needs to encompass that this is the idea. We need to, to put our eyes on the effects, not just on the impasse. We need to radically diminish our impasse in order to get into the structures of the effort. So we need to think on effectiveness, not just on efficiency. We need to talk a little bit more than environmental management systems, a little bit more about uh, environmental reporting. We need to come up with integrated things. We need, to we need to frame a different change in the way we manage business today. And in accordance with what I, I heard in the previous talk, we need a lot more of cooperation, a lot more of collaboration, a, more, a lot more about integration of different disciplines because you cannot work these days in isolation because everything is, is, everything is, is linked these, these days. So tomorrow we'll work with this. Uh, the, the idea of business in nature is to, to come up with working in two different frameworks. One framework is we need to rethink the corporate value chain of the companies and the interlinks in between uh, suppliers, providers, uh, companies, big companies, mega, co mega corporations, whatever. We need to work a little bit more. We need to focus on industrial process, but also in the upstream, in the downstream of this value chain, in the new business models that needs to be created, which are going to be thousands of new business models that will be created in order to solve the environmental crisis, but from the social part, from the natural part, and to put different strategies, corporate strategies, in place in order to encompass that. Okay, so uh, this is the end of the history until 2020, 2030, and uh, we need to create some, something new. And uh, the hope, uh, we don't have time to, to go right now, but uh, tomorrow, for those of you who are in the, in the summer school, we will be debating how to use this, these ideas into, to solve this equation between climate and energy. And uh, uh, in my classes, I use a lot uh, John Cotter. This is a guru of organizational change because we need to promote change. Eh? We need to promote change. And we need to understand clearly what these particular lines are showing to you. If we maintain the impact of our activities, the efforts are growing. Yeah? If we all the time send the same quantity of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, the atmosphere is changing. The concentration of this gas in the atmosphere is changing. The effects are changing. And what is driving processes, natural processes, social processes, are the effects, not just the impact. So we, and the problem is that we are not having this. The problem is that impacts are growing, so efforts are growing more, and we are just passing thresholds. So we need to come back to something that is the couple our growth, our economic prosperity for the future, of our impacts. Huh? Big, big decouple, big decoupling, and uh, that will try to maintain the, the efforts in a, in a level that could, could be beneficial for all of us. So we will just deal with this equation tomorrow. So as a conclusion, uh, this is what is needed, uh, enhanced social capital, not not as much for the Western world as for the other world that is there, for these four, five billion of people that are coming, that they want to consume as us, but they shouldn't consume in the way we do. They need to do it in, an, in another way. But we need to, to help these guys to, to improve the, the, the welfare of, of, the, of the societies because uh, you, you know what, what they are suffering and you know what this is affecting us in kind of, you know, migration, wars, terrorism, things, and things like that. So we need drastic reductions of our impact on, on natural systems because we want to maintain the state of this natural system or to improve this, this state. There is plenty of business for the future in the reconstruction of what we have been degraded and we have been just uh, uh, destroying. And, of course, to ensure the provision of goods and services. So prosperity, effectiveness, and resilience will be three of the words that uh, we are pushing forward these days. So this is business in nature, the concept to move up into the corporate society in the 21st century, in which we concentrate on the efforts at the same time that we are doing business, because business is profitable growth. Huh? But uh, if this profitable growth is decoupled from 
the consequences that uh, we are producing these days, then the future is a little bit uh, shaky. Huh? Okay, so thank you for your attention. I think I'm going to leave it here and uh, for the next. Um, see you now. Next, I would like to tell you a few things about uh, some of the theoretical background uh, we use uh, for our work in the Craft Center regarding regional and local development and a couple of linkages between business and, uh, and these type of development processes. And I will highlight two or three of these examples. Uh, of course, we don't have time to go into much detail, but what we are looking at uh, is these kind of questions in Kurseg, in the Kurseg region, and other parts of, uh, of Hungary. Um, my background is business, so uh, it was interesting to listen to Rafa, whose background is actually natural sciences. And being a natural scientist, he's teaching in business schools for many, many years. I think that's uh, a very interesting perspective. Uh, now we will see a couple of examples here, uh, and I will try to also uh, show you what we are going to do in the future in the craft uh, project. Um, the idea is that, and I think some of the presentations will reinforce uh, that uh, uh, what I'm saying here now, and there is much literature uh, talking about the importance of business in sustainability issues. Uh, yesterday in the summer school we played a simulation called the Fishbanks. This Fishbank simulation is about uh, the tragedy of the commons. Most of us would know this phenomena from uh, basic economic literature, uh, but it's still very interesting. It's a very simple exercise, in fact, with a, uh, very few uh, factors to influence in teams of, uh, uh, in, in teams actually representing companies. Uh, but even those uh, very few factors can result in a situation where we cannot resolve the problem in a business setting when we manage resources, natural resources, which are commonly owned. Uh, now, we see uh, many of these uh, issues uh, in regional and local development issues. Many uh, assets are in common or in municipality ownership, uh, and this is maybe why cooperation uh, is a very important topic in this regard. So competition and collaboration, this is a very, uh, um, I would say, even fashionable topic in business, uh, as Rafa already mentioned. Uh, businesses are now even collaborating with UN organizations, which is uh, quite new. Businesses are collaborating with municipalities, uh, with each other, and there are many new initiatives in collaboration. But of course, uh, we see collaboration in, in, in life uh, where we don't really want to see collaboration. We just think about the recent scandal in Germany between the uh, big uh, car companies. Uh, of course, we believe that all of them are competing hard on the market, but at the same time, it turns out that they are collaborating at a certain level and making advantage of this type of collaboration. So not all collaboration is actually good. We have to distinguish this uh, uh, up front. Uh, emerging sustainability challenges uh, will explain why do we need uh, to talk about collaboration. We see that competition all alone will not solve the problem. Many theoretical economists would believe that competition will solve and optimize the, the economy, but we see that uh, with the tragedy of commons and similar problems, we need cooperation. And of course, any organization is competing and collaborating at the same time. We just have to come to a right balance. Now, I will uh, show you a couple of examples here, but we see that our, at least the Hungarian society is not very uh, good at collaborating. Uh, this is, of course, different in different countries, but, but we know that we need much more collaboration uh, to solve environmental problems. Uh, and it looks like the governments cannot solve environmental and social problems all alone. We see many examples where the governments actually fail, where there are regulations. Regulations may be too complicated. We have about 300 regulations in the European Union regarding the environment alone. But we also see that some of these problems are only pushed to other countries, other continents, and even we have some uh, environmental problems which we cannot deal with. I just think about looking at uh, Professor Baumgartner between Austria and Hungary. We have issues regarding some of the rivers polluted from some companies. Uh, in a regulated environment, we have 300 regulations dealing with different types of pollutants. So, uh, on the one hand, governments are not able to solve these problems all alone. Uh, second, actually businesses can benefit from this type of cooperation. Uh, unfortunately, many of the managers, many of the business uh, leaders don't see the benefits yet, 
So that's our role to actually convince them that this is going to happen and this is good for them. And there is many international policy initiatives mentioned already by Rafa, uh, the Agenda 21, which has actually a local agenda version, uh, action for local governments, uh, the Rio Plus 20 Corporate Sustainability Forum, and so on and so on. Uh, the World Business Council for uh, Sustainable Development actually developed the business version of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, so there are many, many initiatives which would actually go into this uh, regard. So our objective here is to uh, basically uncover mo mo motivation factors. What would motivate companies to cooperate with local governments, uh, with NGOs, with civil society, uh, with each other to solve problems? Um, once we can answer these questions or this uh, seemingly simple question, then we can of course move ahead and learn about the factors and, and uh, provide some, in, in, some, some insights for, for policymakers at the local or uh, regional level. Uh, we use a number of theories. I'm not going to go into detail, of course. These are mainly management theories, uh, transaction cost economic resource dependency, which try to explain the behavior of uh, businesses. Uh, they, also, they always will focus on one uh, uh, important factor in the transaction cost economics. It's about the, the cost of transactions on the market, uh, resource dependency will we'll uh, we'll focus on resources, including natural human resources, any type of resources which will define the success of a company in the market. Uh, we all know stakeholder theory, which is something we use here in the craft project, uh, trying to involve all the stakeholders. Organizational learning will talk about how organizations learn. It's not only individual learning, but organizational learning, which is a different level. Uh, uh, it's not only the employees or the CEO or the management or the experts of an, of an organization who actually learn uh, from uh, previous experience, but organizations may learn. And we'll see whether this is actually happening or not. Institutional theory, for example, looks at uh, whether companies are seeking for uh, justification to be part of a local uh, society. Uh, so there are many, many uh, uh, theoretical uh, suggestions we can use and uh, we are using these to, to uncover the motivations. So here's what are the mediating factors or the motivations. Now, four examples I have here, and I will go into three of them, is uh, industrial ecosystems. This uh, idea has been around for, I think, at least 20 years, if not more, 20, 30 years. And in fact, this originates from practice. This is not something coming up from theory, uh, but a couple of initiatives coming up, the most famous one most of us would know is uh, the industrial uh, symbiosis project in Kalundborg in Denmark. Uh, so it's coming up from, from practice and some practitioners, actually engineers, came up with the idea that maybe we should share resources uh, and we should use the waste of one process or one company uh, as the resource of another company or another process. This could be, of course, done within the same company, which is actually happening. In most companies, the resources are utilized quite well. But if you go outside of the company borders, usually this is not happening. What we did, and I will show you a, a few slides, um, we asked industrial parks in this country. We have more than uh, maybe 150 or so uh, industrial parks. Some of them are operating quite well. Some of them are not so successful. We asked them whether they have at all a limited understanding of industrial ecosystems or what is happening. Uh, next one, I will talk a little bit about the third one here, business and NGO cooperation. What are businesses thinking about NGOs and what are NGOs thinking about businesses? This is of course very important for us uh, because they can help each other. I'm not going to talk much about sustainable supply chains. That could be a different uh, presentation. Uh, Rafa already mentioned the upstream and downstream. This is something I'm talking about. How do you actually coordinate work within your supply chain. Now we understand that it's not single companies competing on the market, but it's more like supply chains uh, competing on the market because just the organization, the way you organize the supply chain, the companies you source your resources from can influence your success on the market. And then finally I will talk about the second one here, regional and local initiatives, and I will tell you what we are going to do and hopefully uh, achieving in the next one or two years. So industrial ecosystems, uh, here this is basically about, I mean, if you want to simplify it, it's about recycling. Reusing and recycling waste materials. So in principle, this is very simple. You can easily show uh, that recycling and reusing waste is much 
more beneficial for the environment than uh, actually using new raw materials. I mean, depending, of course, on the raw material, depending on the uh, transaction costs, meaning the transportation, and so on and so on. For some reason, this is still not really much happening. You look at all the industrial parks in Hungary, and we found no actual example of any industrial ecology in this country. This was a couple of years ago. Maybe there is happening now, something happening now, but I'm not sure. In fact, uh, we asked um, about 30 industrial parks, and none of them could actually define the term industrial ecology. Some of them were guessing this something has to do with the environment, but they actually had no idea. We, had, we didn't ask companies, actually. We asked the organizations, the umbrella organizations, which are organizing the industrial parks, so they are the ones who should know about managing industrial parks. And obviously, an industrial symbiosis system is most suitable for an industrial park where you have a limited area, there is no transportation cost, companies know about each other, they work together, they have been around for years, uh, still uh, we found almost no experience uh, in this regard. The only thing some of these parks actually do is they organize uh, waste management together. That's, what, that's a service of an industrial park that they do organize waste management, but this does not include recycling or, or utilization. This means that they will get rid of uh, the waste materials. Um, so this is actually not really happening. Uh, question could be why. I mean, he, here are some results from, from the survey. And if you look at, you know, I mean, higher is better. Uh, so number four here, cooperation with other organizations is important. So all companies, uh, or okay, all industrial parks uh, asked um, about cooperation. They said this is very important, but they are not doing it. So the question is, what is actually the barrier to, to do these things. Or number six, environmental aspects considered when founding IP, industrial park, which means that when we said, I mean, this was 1990s when a lot of industrial parks came around in Hungary, right? Uh, in fact, there is a regulation regarding industrial parks. It's not just like you call anything an industrial park. This is an official kind of title which comes with some benefits, right? Uh, so this happened, and the reason why, because some of these industrial parks are coming from old socialist industries, so there were some clean-up activities up front. But then if you look at uh, number seven, environmental aspects considered when accepting companies, this would be, of course, very interesting for industrial symbiosis, because you want to pick companies which can actually complement each other. You want companies which can utilize the waste of another company in the same industrial park. Now, this is actually, I mean, the lowest, which means that it's not really happening. I mean, they will not maybe accept a very dirty business, but they're not matching businesses in industrial park. Actually, most of the industrial parks are just happy to accept any company entering. Okay? So, in fact, this is not something parks are thinking of when they are uh, organizing their operations. Um, okay? um, very few managers were aware of the whole concept. Uh, services were very basic, what they are doing. Uh, one thing they were actually active in was uh, trying to get some money. Industrial park management uh, often helps uh, companies within the park to get some funding from Hungarian or European sources. This is something they coordinated quite well, but that was, that was all basic. Um, okay, so this is, uh, this is a story we should work a little bit more on. And uh, um, working with business models, I come to the topic of trust. And if you think about uh, industrial parks and sourcing my resources from other companies, then one thing we have to consider is how much I trust the source. Uh, if I buy something, uh, uh, raw material from, from the market, brand new raw material, then I have a whole area of suppliers. I can choose the best suppliers. If some goes out of business, I can find another one. But all the existing, very few examples of industrial parks around the world uh, are including companies which have been around for 30, 40, maybe 50 years, and they knew each other for at least 20, 30 years. So to, to set up relationships between businesses which are implementing industrial symbiosis need a lot of trust between the organizations. So maybe here, this is a very soft issue, of course, how can you build trust between organizations? Now, just think about Kurseg, which does have an industrial park, uh, I don't know how much operational, it's a very, very small thing, with a couple of dozen of very small companies, uh, and maybe one or two which I would call medium-sized, no big companies here. Uh, 
you know, the first thing would be to, to, to set up some trust between the local government and the companies, and then between the companies, so that we can even think about industrial simulation. So it's not, not uh, money usually, right? Another example of uh, this type of trust issue is when we talk about chemical leasing. Chemical leasing is when you don't buy your chemicals, say maintenance chemicals or cleaning chemicals or whatever, a glue, but you actually provide a service, a gluing service, instead of selling your glue. Now, when you sell the glue, then the company who's buying it can do actually whatever they want with it, right? If I buy the service, I have to let the company into my own company, which means that I need much more trust in that company. Of course, it's completely beneficial from an environmental perspective because the amount of waste will be reduced, the interest of the parties will change completely. I don't want to sell more and more stuff. I want to sell more services with less material, right? But trust is a, is a, is a central concept here, which is uh, uh, a barrier to uh, implementation. All right, uh, just go through fast because I think I'm, I'm talking up too much time. Um, here we looked at uh, the second topic I'm, I wanted to talk about is NGO and uh, civil organizations and businesses. And here we did a, a little research. This was more SME, small and medium sized companies, because when we talk about business and NGO cooperation, we usually think about multinational businesses supporting the local football team or, or some health issues or some social issues or some CSR activities. But small companies don't have the time, the money, the resources, the expertise to provide any CSR programs. And we expected that we'll find nothing actually at SMEs. And I should say that uh, this is not true. I mean, SMEs happen to be in some ways much more embedded in local society than large organizations. This is a typical chart uh, or table. Same things, I mean, we did the same research many, many times before. What are the motivation factors for, for companies to do, do environmental or social, deal with social issues? SMEs are not different from multinational companies. Uh, regulations are the most important uh, uh, factors uh, than managers uh, and my uh, commercial buyers, so the, the, the ones, the companies I'm selling to. And local communities and environmental organizations are usually always in the middle. Not the last, but in the middle somewhere. So they are important, but not as important as regulations. This is not much different from big business. Uh, here we also ask them, uh, uh, both NGOs and SMEs, what do they think about, uh, about uh, cooperation and the role of NGOs? What should an NGO actually do? Anyway, so we looked at SMEs and we expected that SMEs don't have much to do with civil organizations, with NGOs, and have no cooperation. But it turns out that they are much closer to local issues. When you think about a multinational company, the first thing a multinational company should actually do with a CSR program is to uncover what are the problems. <laughs> Just think about this, a local business doesn't have to, to go to, to this step. They know the local problems, they know the local issues. Just think about the restaurants here in Kursak, some of them could actually contribute with some local problems, with food problems. We have the milk bar just on the corner on the main square. They are actually giving away uh, food from yesterday for a very low, low price, and they do have some people who are regulars and coming and pick up that food. I mean, they know the local, they actually know the people. Right? So, in fact, SMEs are very often what we found in the research is that, that leaders of SMEs are managers of SMEs and owners are also part of local NGOs. I mean, in big multinational corporations, this is not, usually not the situation. Um, so, in fact, uh, that was a very interesting experience, uh, but at the same time, usually they had no resources, they had other problems uh, which prevented them to do uh, more stuff. So, uh, then, moving on to the last one. And, I'm not sure whether this will ever get back. Uh, the last one was looking at how regional development and local development can be somehow uh, fostered by, by, by businesses. And here we are actually implementing a research within the craft project. Now we are preparing a survey which is asking companies how much do they do in the local community. Uh, we, know, we know from these cities where we've been working over the last few years that there are some initiatives, but basically the integration of work between businesses and local governments. There are some companies which are not talking to the local government for some reasons because they expect more support from the local government, but then they are not going to do anything on their own. So there is somehow uh, a lack of understanding that the future is uh, collaboration. So what we are going to do is ask uh, company managers uh, within the craft project and actually integrate that result with our result from, from the municipalities. We are also asking municipalities uh, 
what do you expect from companies? Now, of course, the first thing, we do, we do need more money. Yeah? But maybe it's a bit more complex than that. So that's the plan for the, for the next couple of uh, months. And, uh, um, but what we actually found, we made a small survey already in, the, in, in a small region in the Yasha, mm -hmm. where we are going to work hopefully in the, in the future as well. And what we actually found is that the long-term perspective is missing. Imagine a big multinational company which can move their plants from one country to another one in a few months. How can the local government set up a, an energy program, right, if the company is moving in a few weeks or months? So the, so the company was actually, this company we interviewed and the local government we interviewed, was not able to agree on the energy program of the, of the city because they could ne never rely on the company staying in the city for at least three, four, five more years. Now, an energy project requires at least 10, 15, maybe 20 years of planning ahead. Now, if especially some cities believe that, of course, it's a nice thing to have a big multinational company because a lot of tax is paid by the company, right? But if you have a dependence on that single company, then infrastructure development is an issue. How can you trust the company? And in fact, the company will use this position to get some more tax benefits. So this is what is actually preventing us from, from uh, cooperating in the, in the local. Um, usually this short-term thinking, what we found. Uh, now it, it was interesting to see that all of these companies and regions and local governments, they mention resource efficiency. Seems to be very important for, for all of them. Um, but uh, for companies, this means that we want to save and secure our resources didn't go any further than that. They wanted to make sure that they will have the resources. In fact, in this country now, it's about human resources most. So maybe the cooperation should start now with how local governments can train people. And in fact, in this Yashag region, the, where we are discussing with the local municipality, the first and most important question is how can we actually educate people for the next 10, 15 years? Because human resource seems to be the most important uh, uh, resource for them. So anyway, I think uh, this is not going to happen anytime soon at least. So I'm finishing. Welcome again. Um, I come from Graz in Austria less than two hours, but nevertheless, it's the first time I'm here in Kershek. So sometimes things are quite close, but you don't see them or you don't visit them. Uh, my topic is on corporate sustainability um, and what I would like to focus on is to give this uh, topic of how can corporations be more sustainable a kind of a strategic perspective. Um, I work as professor for sustainability management. I'm director of the Institute of System Sciences Innovation Sustainability Research. We are about 25 people working in these three areas of system sciences. Here we work on agent-based modeling of social systems. In innovation studies, we work on transition of energy systems and on bioeconomy. And in sustainability research, we mainly work in corporate sustainability uh, with uh, on some work on strategies, business models, innovation, and impact measurement. So as I said, I want to bring you two topics today. First of all, how can we conceptualize the meaning of strategy? We all use the word strategy or strategic very often, but sometimes it's not so sure what we really mean with that. And second, I will use this uh, strategic perspectives for corporate sustainability management from a strategic viewpoint. This means bringing together strategy, culture, and implementation. What is strategy? There are dozens and dozens of definitions about strategy. It's sure it has something to do with the future direction, with the long time, long term direction. Um, first, definitions of strategy came from the military sector. There are some definitions older than 2,000 years old. In the business sector, it's about how it defines a corporation in which business it wants to be in, in which way it conducts its business, in which way it, it is successful. Um, so as Hinterhuber says, strategy is the way of using resources and capabilities of an organization. 
And there are many, many approaches in strategic management. I won't go into the details of that, but uh, you can recall the market-based view by Porter, uh, which was heavily criticized by Barney, and then he developed the resource-based view. And very interestingly, for people working on CSR and corporate sustainability, in the new version of the resource-based view, he plays a stakeholder into the heart of his theory. Uh, then Minsberg came and say, said, more or less, forget about all these planned strategies. It's all emergent. Um, we have the further improvements of the resource-based view, the relational view, dynamic capabilities, and with this uh, notion of strategy as practice. So we have very different approaches here who try to explain how can a company be successful in the market. But in essence, I would say strategic means that there is something like an overall goal, objective, or vision, or a picture of success. Something where you can say, this is where I want to go to. And second, pathways or guidelines toward, towards this goal, or vision, or picture of success. And this is the starting point uh, where I want to bring strategy closer to the topic of sustainable development and sustainability. Because in case of corporate sustainability, the goal should be sustainable development. And what does this mean? We had uh, before a wonderful presentation by Raphael on the development of sustainable development and its understanding in management. <coughs> what in my view is very important, sustainable development is an inherently normative concept. Yeah? It has a very strong ethical cornerstone, an ethical clue in it. Because what we want to sustain, in which way we want to sustain, is in the end a normative question, regardless which kind of definitions and frameworks we build after that. Uh, Raphael already mentioned um, ground land and the uh, triple bottom line. Um, what I think is a very important step in the whole discussion of sustainable development is the framework for strategic sustainable development, the FECSD, also known as the natural step framework, because this is then the NGO trying to, promoting, to promote this FECSD, with general, <coughs> comprehensive principles defining sustainable development for a certain system. I think this is a very huge achievement we have here. What, what does this mean now for business? Um, strategic perspectives I would like to distinguish uh, if it's strategic equals to successful or desirable for the company and or for the business sector. So what is the interest for the firm? Why it should be interested in CSR or corporate sustainability at all? And there we have two different notions. One notion is the classical business case idea. So, follow sustainability-oriented goals and make more profit with them. Yeah, this is a kind of um, narrow understanding focusing more on financial benefits. And we have another notion, the societal case for business. This is what Rafa mentioned as the corporate sustainability 3.0, if I recall correctly. So the idea that business is doing something positive for society and for the natural ecosystem. In a narrow understanding, and this trade-off or this versus between business case and societal case has to do with conflicts we have. Yeah? Of course, we like all this uh, notion of win-win-win situations where incre in, uh, improved, increased eco-efficiency will increase profits. But in reality, in the day-to-day -day business, we have trade-offs between economic, <coughs> social, and environmental goals. And the question how an organization is dealing with these trade-offs will lead to the answer if a company or organization is following more the business case logic or the societal case logic. And in a narrow understanding, it's all about financial benefits, lower costs, higher revenues. In a wider understanding, it can also uh, lead to uh, improved competitiveness, legitimation, so license to operate by stakeholders, not only consumers, uh, improved innovative capacity of an organization. Yeah? If you think comprehensively 
about how an organization can be more sustainable, more environmental friendly, more social inclusive, then you will develop new ideas about how you do business, about your products and about your services. And this will lead to an improved competitiveness based on more innovative solutions. <clears throat> so, the core of the debate is, is it strategic also for society in nature? Yeah, this is this corporate sustainability 3.0. Is it positive? Is there positive impact and outcome of corporate activities on society and nature? And what I want to introduce uh, now are the three perspectives in the understanding of strategy. And this is strategy process, content, and context, because these dimensions will help us to refine uh, uh, sustainability-related strategy. The first one is the content. The content is, of course, how can we bring in sustainability into the strategy of an organization. And this dimension should, sh should secure that the framework, the strategy, the approach, project in question contributes to sustainability. So what is the strategic contribution to the overall goal of sustainable development? That is a core question of the strategy content if you want to make, deliver or if you want to develop a more sustainable organization. The other one is the process. How, to do, how do, we, do we develop that? Whom to take into account? And this is related to the question of how and who is in focus. So how is the strategy developed and who is involved? Is it a very narrow understanding or is it a broader understanding, bringing more stakeholders, more people into the strategy planning process? And the third one is the strategy context. So the surrounding societal, political, market environment, and natural environment. So do we consider all relevant circumstances, circumstances influencing sustainability for this organization? Especially secondary stakeholders are very often overlooked in stakeholder management. Do we identify all relevant developments and trends outside from the small system we are working in? And in considering these three dimensions, the content, how can we be, what is the core of sustainability for this organization, the process, how to develop the strategy, and the context, bringing the big picture, will allow us to develop a more sustainable company and organization. Here is a short example um, of how we can use these three perspectives. This is a part of, was part of a project on sustainable supply chain management. And one sustainability issue is, of course, gender equality. And how can we consider that in su sustainable supply chain management? And here we f find, again, these three perspectives. The, so the strategy process is a very classical one. Define the relevant aspects, sustainability aspects, for the supply chain. This means analyze what is going on today, what is written in international, national standards, etc. It's quite clear gender is identif identified as relevant sustainability topic. How can we translate that into something companies can follow and manage? So how can we transform that into manageable uh, indicators and data? So which kind of data, qualitative and quantitative data, uh, do we need for that? Here are also some uh, hints from international standards which data are needed for that. The third one is a very important. It's not only about the data, it's also about um, general commitments, plans of an organization. It's not only measuring how much movement you have in top management, it's also about what is the strategy and plan and vision of the company. And the fourth one, if you work in supply chain management, how can you influence the whole supply chain? How can you aggregate information along the supply chain? And what also brings us then the third dimension, the context is into, in, into the game is the integration of secondary stakeholders. Yeah? Not only the narrow understanding 
of the business partners along the supply chain because if you focus only on them, then the result would be it's not an important topic, honestly, if you work in organizations and discuss this topic with them. Yeah? So therefore, this context is here a very important aspect. Uh, now I would like to speak a bit about corporate sustainability uh, from my viewpoint. And the first question is, what should be made more sustainable? It can be, of course, the organization itself. So it's activities and processes, the production, more eco-efficient, using more renewable energy, better, better waste management, working in an industrial park, improving industrial ecology, and maybe equally or even more important, what is the company offering? The products and services. But is an organization can help consumers, customers to be more sustainable. And of course you can do a combination. And a truly sustainable organization should focus on both. Having a very efficient and sustainable organization, very efficient and sustainable way of delivering products and services, which themselves are also sustainable or contributing to a sustainable development. Let me show this with this uh, figure. We have here uh, a company, um, very simplified. The company very often has a strategy. Um, every social organization has a kind of culture. So values embedded via the members of the organization, via the employees, and actions. And this will lead to a certain sustainability performance based on the internal activities and based on the products and services. In my view, it's important to distinguish between the sustainability performance of the organization and the final impact this performance has on society and on nature. Because there are mediating effects of stakeholders and social, social, cultural, and economic conditions. Look, for instance, on biodiversity. The relevance of biodiversity is in Germany much lower than in France, for instance. Yeah? Because of a different social, cultural understanding. Yeah? So the way people see a specific topic as important or not important has, of course, an impact then back on the organization. And uh, these uh, three dimensions of process, of context, and of content are also shown here. And if an organization can have or reach a fit between its strategy in the strategy content between societal value and its strategy, then it can really deliver sustainable, a sustainability performance and sustainable solution and contribute to the societal value. Bringing in the strategy context helps to improve the business value, yeah? Because you have a more comprehensive, more inclusive understanding of what is important for your organization. So by this, Process, content, content, and context can help the organization to, um, to uh, identify, develop, and also implement a sustainability-oriented strategy. What is also important is, in my view, is that we have to distinguish three different management levels in an organization. Very often, we only focus on strategy and implementation. That's, of course, through and important. What are our strategic goals is the main question for every CEO and every board of an organization. So to determine long-term goals and product service market combinations, and then the question of how to make them, uh, bring them into practice, make them real life. But we shouldn't forget that there's also a normative management level. There's also something on what stands the organization for? What is the management philosophy? Who are we as organization and who do we want to be? What is the purpose for us as organization in our environment, in our society? And here the values, attitudes, judgments, beliefs come into the picture. Because they heavily influence the strategic choices you will make as organization and the way you will bring strategy into life. Uh, just very briefly, there are different definitions of uh, organization culture. 
A very famous one and also a uh, very broadly used one is by uh, Schein. He says we can distinguish artifacts, values, and basic assumptions. Artifacts are something visible, like people are dressed, like offices are designed, how products are designed. This gives a kind of indication of which culture this organization might have, yeah? But it's not sufficient. The second one are values. Values are here is post justification, something an organization says we stand for customer loyalty or whatever. Yeah? But both are heavily influenced by these basic assumptions, by this unconscious is taken for granted beliefs, thoughts, and feelings of the members of organizations. What people, what employees perceive as true or false will govern the values, the artifacts, and the actions, so also the strategies. This is a very important element we should not forget in any discussion about corporate sustainability. And here is a simple um, uh, conceptual framework showing four different types of sustainability strategies. Introverted is a very, as introverted means, passive, reactive one. Visionary is a truly sustainable organization. So for an introverted uh, strategy, you don't really need a deep foundation of sustainability topics, values in the organizational culture. But if you want to be a truly sustainable organization, you have to believe in the value of sustainable development. Not only in a trained way, as we would like to be, but you have to be open for sustainability. You have to have the understanding in the employees, in the leadership team, that sustainable development is an intrinsic value we should strive for. Otherwise, such strategies won't work. And this is a very often overlooked element in the discussion of corporate sustainability. Uh, here they are these four strategies I've just mentioned. So um, there are two dimensions. Um, more or less, this is the life cycle perspective. So this is within the organization. This takes uh, the life cycle more into account. And this is the advocacy of the strategy. So is it more targeted to the market or to the society? And we can then distinguish these four types of strategies. So basically, introverted means reactive, yeah? reacting to legal obligations, so being legal compliant, minimize risks of uh, regulations of stakeholder pressure. Then the focus here in the conservative strategy is internal on eco-efficiency, yeah? reducing costs by reducing uh, resources, uh, energy consumption, etc. Extroverted is focusing on the license to operate. Yeah? Being perceived as a good company allows you to do your business. This is especially in uh, uh, some sectors relevant, like chemical industry or others. And visionary means that you truly develop an organization committed to sustainability in a way that you are successful in markets they are existing or you're developing in a way that you're also contributing to sustainable development. So I would place this uh, uh, corporate sustainability 3.0 here maybe, yeah? So really make a positive impact. The reality is, in my view, and based on research we're doing in Austria, is that we have very few companies in this, in this area, yeah? Most, most are here, honestly, yeah? And many companies are here in conservative or in a mixture with conservative or extroverted. And then we have these extroverted cases of greenwashing. Yeah? So we have many, many companies publishing wonderful mission statements, wonderful reports. And if you look on their performance, you identify a kind of gap between them, what they say and what they do. Um, just mention shortly, we, done, we have done research on sustainability, sustainable business models and strategies. Quantitative studies, qualitative studies, and the common denominator of all this research we have done is the most important role is on leadership, on employee motivation and culture. So these more soft factors are so important. Of course, you have to have a proper process and define um, um, 
correct things and the correct indicate and have a good management system, whatever, if you don't have leadership believing in it, people's motivated doing that, you won't be successful. Yeah? And this is why it's so hard for many organizations to go to this visionary step, this visionary strategy. So finally, I want to explain it into detail. Um, we have developed here a kind of framework, putting all this together I just mentioned to you. So this normative level with this organizational culture and vision and policy, with the strategic level and the operational implementation. Just one element I want to emphasize, so we have here the four strategies, is the planning principle. Um, Normally, companies are following a classical strategic planning approach, more or less forecasting. You do a SWOT analysis, you say where you're good, where you're bad, where do you see opportunities and risk, and then you define a strategy. Another approach coming from, ener from the energy planning sector is backcasting. Yeah? You first define where you want to be. So you want to be a sustainable zero impact company in 10 years. And then you say, okay, when I want to be a zero impact company in 10 years, what do I have to do today? So it reverses the picture, the approach is strategic planning. Yeah? And this is also sometimes a bit unusual to the corporations. So just to conclude, strategic perspectives, in my view, help businesses to understand what is strategic successful for them, for their core business, for the classical business, but also help them to understand how they can contribute to the goals of sustainable development. And so, going more to the societal case for, for business of companies. Thank you very much. First of all, thanks to everybody for uh, being here, for inviting me. Uh, thanks to Kraft and uh, I ask and Gula for organizing, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, first time in this city, I had the chance to uh, walk around yesterday, it's wonderful, so uh, congratulations and uh, preserve uh, uh, the heritage you have. Uh, and uh, coming from a country like Italy and being married with a Spanish, another country I know very well, over the last uh, 40 years in both countries we've been damaging so much our environment, with new buildings, uh, without any regulation and so on. So it was wonderful to see such a protected and I would say uh, very, very unique uh, uh, center uh, of the city that you have. So it was wonderful. So starting from that, I'm Italian. Uh, it's close to noon. Uh, I'm going to talk about pasta. So that's the story. And <laughs> So uh, that's a story very, very typical from somebody coming from my country. We consume 23 kilos of pasta per person per year. The second country is Argentina, I think, or Brazil, half the amount. So we double uh, the amount of pasta. If you do some calculation, 23 kilo uh, per person, you can ever have an average per day. And uh, uh, apart from that, uh, being from Mediterranean area, eating a lot of pasta, uh, I think that our expectancy is among the top three countries in terms of life in the world. So pasta is not something that damage your health. Uh, and uh, that's the main purpose, no, it's not the main purpose of the presentation, but I'm going to try to address a topic uh, which is awfully new and link uh, to uh, the main uh, uh, objective of this conference. So uh, the title is very long, as you see, Cultivating Ecological Knowledge for Corporate Sustainability. So we're playing with words here, cultivating ecological knowledge with a pasta company very much grounded into the agriculture uh, system and therefore into local communities. And uh, uh, Barilla, who is the name of the company, it is a case-based uh, paper, uh, works I think being a large company uh, works with a very innovative approach. I learned about that years, years ago, around a decade ago. I've known the company all my life, of course. Uh, but it was very intriguing and I started investigating and I'm now in very good relation with the company. And uh, the result was uh, a first paper we just published with my co-author, 
I want to uh, really uh, mention, and, and I'm grateful uh, to work with Monica. Monica, she's a Canadian, a German, as, as um, uh, I mean, she was born in German, but, but she spent the majority of her life in the US and in Canada, and uh, we work together uh, since many years. So I will briefly focus my research background. I am at Bocconi in the management and technology department, but I mainly work with sustainability and environmental social issues since uh, I graduated in 1992. Uh, and then we will have a very short focus on Barilla, just to let you know two information about the company and then the paper and uh, some ideas that might be hopefully also attractive and interesting for Kraft and IASC. So, uh, what I'm doing, I am very much motivated by guys that are outside my disciplinary domain, which is management and organization. Gregory Bateson is one of my inspiring, I would say, scholar, he uh, was a great anthropologist, uh, not only, he did many, many things. And uh, the quoting is uh, uh, one of the sentences that I love, the major problem in the world are the result of the difference between how nature works and the way people think. So this is this silos and there is vertical, I mean, ivory tower approach of science versus the interconnectedness and the system view of nature. Uh, starting from that, uh, what I'm doing is mainly to work at the intersection between business, management and organization is about business, of course, and nature ecosystem and society. That's why I've been working very much with Rafa, Rafael Sardin, the previous speaker, with whom we are working right now on a number of activities and I had the chance to spend one year with him uh, in Barcelona just a few years ago. And uh, I'm also grateful to uh, uh, a couple of colleagues here, Adam Budnikowski and, and Shandor Karekesh, with whom I spent more than 20 years of my life. Uh, and uh, a lot of my ideas have been permeated by inspiring talk I received 20 years ago about multidisciplinarity and convergence of very different disciplines. I am in management, we are extremely conservative. So my domain is based on impact factor ranking. We have five journals where we need to publish where sustainability is still very, very marginal, I would say. So starting from that, uh, over the years, I learned a little bit more. This is in the gray area, management organization studies, our theories, and I understood that the best basic theory of management is practice. So we've been populated by psychology, micro level, individual, sociology, institutional theory was mentioned, and economics, cost transaction theory, for example. So we don't have a lot of native theories in management. Uh, Starting from that, my interest in ecology moved me on the right side, modern ecology, and since uh, I wrote my master thesis, I was very much into this way of thinking. So I've been passing through years after years and studying what is modern ecology, uh, system and complexity, adaptive system theories, and so on. And, of course, ecological economics, that from economics was a novel issue more than 20 years ago when uh, uh, Daly and Costanza started with this new approach. Uh, my idea is to try to permeate the boundaries, the green, with what I learned from ecology and from ecological economics, but do also the reverse thing. I think that in organization and management, we have some very interesting perspective that are not at all inside modern ecology and ecological economics, where organizations simply do not exist. If you take Eleanor Ostrom, she never talked about organization. There is the macro and the micro, the individual and the system. Never mention organization. So if you can Google and search organization in the old study she did, they are not mentioned, Mo extremely marginally. So I think that organizations are a key piece of our society. That's where innovation, uh, we talk about that, uh, you just mentioned that, take place. Innovation take place into organization. It's just, not just the individual. I mean, creatives uh, spark that, that generate innovation. So, starting from that, Barilla, quickly. Barilla, spaghetti, we have uh, 27 size of spaghetti. I'm not talking about pasta. Just spaghetti in, in our uh, supermarkets. So, what is Barilla? Barilla is a long-lasting company. Uh, they are 
starting in 1877, four generations of capitalism behind. And now there's these three guys, uh, three brothers, Guido, Luca, and Paolo, they are managing the company. The company is not, um, let's say, on the stock market. They are managed uh, mainly with their own uh, uh, debt and equity system. And uh, uh, it was founded in Parma, which is a wonderful city in Emilia Romagna. They have around 8,000 employees, 3.2 billion of turnover, more than 1,000 products in their portfolio. They want to narrow down the portfolio right now. They control international brands like Vasa. Probably you are familiar with that, but you don't know that it is belonging to Barilla portfolio. And they have top brand pasta like Voyello and Baseline. It's a middle market product. It's not top brand. If I go in the supermarket, 0.8 uh, for one uh, uh, pack of pasta of Barilla, I can get pasta for two, three euros easily. I mean, top brands, very niche market, and so on. So the story is interesting because these guys, the free one, and in particular Paolo, the, the one on the right, are extremely concerned about sustainability. He's a new generation of leaders and entrepreneurs, and they work very much on the topic. So this is the new motto, good for you, uh, sustainable for the planet, that has been embedded in the strategy almost uh, 10 years ago. And of course, there is an issue with the heritage uh, they had the company from their fathers, and they want to handle down the company to the new generation, preserving the relation with the community. So the big issue is how you can internationalize. So you become an international company. They are now working in the U.S. They are opening plants around the world, preserving the local identity coming from Parma. They are very, very grounded in this area, culturally speaking. So that's one of the critical things for the whole story. And of course, what they did, I mean, they changed the organizational system, so it's a proof somehow of an important transformation with the sustainability unit, and they shape this policy. Good for you, your health. I mean, the Mediterranean diet, you have there in this corner, we will go back on this, you see this double pyramid there. I mean, that's uh, a, let's say, tool they develop in order to show the interaction between diet and environmental impact. And of course, they added on a pillar right now, which is good for the community. So the new element of the strategy is good for the community. So why I'm interested? Uh, I'm interested, uh, sorry, uh, because uh, a few years ago I met this guy, Luca Ruini, is the People's Safety and Environmental Energy uh, Director, 30 years in the company, older than me, and I was really surprised learning that the company in 1999 introduced a life cycle assessment for the pasta. So it was almost 20 years ago, and they were already working on a life cycle assessment of pasta. And they defined the standard for the environmental product declaration at European level for the pasta. And then they had this nice model, the double pyramid, where they connect the diet, your health, with the impact on the environment. And of course, I've been participating to a number of workshops, uh, including one on sustainable supply chain, when I got really blown out by the idea of reintroducing rotation in their cultivation system. So if you reintroduce rotation, it means that it works from the economic standpoint. Otherwise, a company which is on the market is not doing that. So rotation fits with being responsible socially, with being environmentally responsible? Probably yes, but what about the economic dimension? So those things put together uh, drive me and draw me uh, to investigate the company, and I had two main questions. One, explore the interdependence between such an organization and the social ecological system. So where you have the interdependence with the community of farmers, because they are not buying simply the durum wheat, which is the main ingredient for pasta, on the stock market. They started a process of reintegration with the farmer, which is a new organizational model, because you imagine that the majority of the company, they are just buying on a stock market. The head of purchasing at Barilla is a guy with a background in um, agronomy. The head of durum wheat is a guy with a background in agronomy. So no financial guy there. 
if you take the purchasing department and uh, I would say of many large corporations, you have guys coming from finance right now for the edging and all these type of things. And then, more in detail, we pick up a concept with Monica, the idea of knowledge. Because the process of generating knowledge was something new. Because a company that buys stock market, let's say, product on the stock market, you can buy a commodity, how much knowledge has about the way of growing? They might have technical knowledge of the quality, but what about the growing factor? So the idea was how they manage knowledge and generate knowledge about farming. So what is the knowledge of such a company about farming? And we started to investigate this issue of ecological knowledge as a key, let's say, construct for our paper. And of course, we went to the literature and quickly, knowledge is a big concept in management with specific type of boundaries. Then we went to modern ecology, I told you I like it, and there is a large stream of papers starting from Folke on ecological knowledge with a different meaning. And then there is the subfield of business and the natural environment with few papers on ecological knowledge, but with a different concept behind, with a different meaning. So we said, well, it's interesting. There is a literature gap there. Let's go and try to frame the concept on the basis of the case. And we developed the concept of ecological knowledge. I don't go in detail. And of course, it's a case study. So the why case study is no way to have a quantitative uh, work on that. We deeply dive into the company relation with the farmer, and we had three phases. Phase one on the how, we started dealing with the company, working on the material, the secondary sources, semi-structure interviews, snowball effect, all the methodology is uh, analyzing the paper, I don't go through. And finally, uh, we had the second phase of confirmation, and the third phase still going on, where I'm checking what are the results of the process dealing with the company. So what are the main findings? First of all, wait, surprising, uh, surprising or not, the company has a deep culture associated with sustainability. In a way of framing sustainability, which is not the one you read on the, news, on the, on the, on the textbook somehow, and it belongs to a process starting from quality, going to, into food safety, then into nutrition, and finally into environmental sustainability. It's more than, uh, it's around two decades of a process of uh, knowing and generating knowledge. Tools that prove that, life cycle assessment, deeply trusting in life cycle assessment, because they did a turnaround from a strategic perspective on the basis of the result of a life cycle assessment. My friends in management, my colleagues do not I mean, trust on that. I had to generate a number of proof, transcription and so on, for having the paper accepted because we got a huge skeptical approach on that. And then uh, the, the, the pyramid that I mentioned and another set of tools. So first finding, knowledge is derived from the deliberate development and use of environmental management tools, which is quite unique for a brand, large brand company the trust into very specific tool. And particularly, why? Because they did this assessment over the years, and it comes out that large part of the impact is on the cultivation phase. So if you check the, the, the step of an LCA, cultivation, the, the type of manufacturing and production, the packaging, and then you go to the transport, Okay, is this a sign on that? <laughs> there should be a sign, but this is not the one. Okay. It's just saying everything going uh, on. Okay, going back to this, uh, what is, what is uh, this, this graph telling you? That if you want to fix the problem, on, try to fix, address the problem of sustainability, uh, mainly the environmental sustainability part, you need to go and talk with the farmer. And again, what is the boundary of such a company? The idea is this is a brand-driven company. So marketing is the core uh, division of the company. So what the hell, I mean, what is the relation between marketing and the farmers, the growers of the, of the Durham wheat? So bridging this has been a long transition, convincing the marketing department still on the way, still not done. But the head of the company, the leaders, got it immediately. 
And they say, we need to go there and change the way of supplying and establish long-term contract again, like it was done in the past with the farmer. Uh, with the farmer. But again, it is something totally new. The other side, if you go into the cooking phase, is also very high, but how to explain to an Italian that you don't have to boil the water for cooking the pasta. So that's something that is not acceptable for us. So you can improve the energy mix, having your solar panel and cook that, but it's not easy. So they decided to, to try to work upstream. And the second point, of the findings, knowledge is derived from deliberate development and use of environmental management tools and connected to the farming dimension, what was the result? Let's try to introduce new approaches to cultivation. But I am a pasta maker, I'm not an agro company. I'm not doing cultivation, so I need to learn and how long it takes. If you do farming in nature, how long it takes to have a new variety of corn, for example? It's not one year, it's not two years. It might take 10 years to have a new variety. Otherwise, you go for hybridization and uh, GMOs, they don't do that for a number of reasons, I don't go in detail. So it's a long process. And they started uh, elaborating knowledge over the years and uh, Unfortunately, uh, the two uh, hair over there, they are not showing the data, but the finding free, they started with this field project with the, the farmer. And the first phase was 2010 and 2011, and the second phase, 2011, 2013. And what they did, they did a pilot project on sustainable durum wheat uh, with Italian farmer. And, uh, uh, of course, they went on field with local communities. They tried different crop rotation instead of monoculture, and they engaged 36 farms. And the result was surprising. Second phase, they added on to the crop rotation technology. So a decision support system, internet connected with your device that allows you to improve the efficiency of the cultivation, looking at the weather forecast and a number of things, the acidity of soil. And finally, guidelines for the farmer. So they codified the knowledge into a set of guidances, very simple, a booklet that is distributed to the farmer to help them improving their way of cultivating. So how they did it? Internally, they had resources, they co-develop the resources with external sources like these specialized companies and working with the university. So, snapshot, where they've been working, 36 farms around Italy, you have different meteorological and condition of soil. They try a number of different combination of rotation for each farm and each situation. And the result is, if you wanna have long-term contract, but the farmer are not just growing durum wheat, they have tomatoes, they have alfa alfa, they might have beans, they might have peas, and so on. What the hell are you doing with all these type of things? I am Barilla, I'm doing pasta, mainly cookies, some tomatoes, sauces, and, and things like that, but I'm not a company working on peas, for example, and beans. So I need to rearrange the way of establishing contract from or vertical to horizontal contract, building platform with other players in order to have this business model successful. And that's where they started a long process engaging other company. Because you need to have companies that make sense for using beans and peas, for example, or the other type of combination you have. Additionally, they learned that in each region, according to the soil, the productivity might be different. So they need different type of combination of rotation, which makes even more complex the organization where the purchasing guy wants to have simplicity, not hundreds of different combinations on his desk. So it was a very long process. They did test with a number of indicators, including, um, let's say, uh, fungi and other type of issue or uh, uh, nitrogen index and so on. And the result, these are some quotation, just to read a couple of that, it is in, from, from the managers. It is interesting that 
we can significantly reduce the CO2 per ton of durum wheat while increasing the yields and the money that the farmer can save. From the agronomic point of view, this is normal, but it's totally forgotten. People are not any longer thinking about that. We are in the, our mainstream way of thinking where monoculture is the rule. So if you talk with people that are working in the field, with the farmer, they tell you, no, no, it's too complex and so on, not, not feasible. This is Barilla Managers. So it is a company with three billion and some euros of turnover. And the result was interesting. These are some of the benefits of corp rotation, reduction in production costs. 31% for the farmer and for the benefit of the company. Reduction in the consumption of fuels, reduction in the carbon footprint, and increase of the efficiency, increase of the yields, and so on. Then they added on the second piece, quickly, the decision support system with technology, the guidelines, and they can add on an increase of the reduction cost, a reduction cost of 10%, and they can add on a reduction of the carbon footprint of 10% and so on. So the combination was a win-win. And in the very end, you have also the social dimension because you have more long-term relation with the farmer. This is not, as I told, a premium price company. So I'm not talking about a niche company that can sell your product to 3.5 euros per package. This is the average big, large, middle size, I mean, uh, middle market company in Italy. So, that were the funding, we open up new stream of discussion on knowledge in management and organization studies. Knowledge, because this is new knowledge, it's not the knowledge companies and managers are developing. It's outside the boundaries, but it's not through the network system that a company has. So it's somehow a new process for us uh, of generating knowledge. And of course, Within our subfield of business and the natural environment, we have a big agenda of uh, research questions that are derived from this study. And the last point is the, f the following one. We try to frame knowledge and knowledge access according to what we learn from modern ecology. So we need to understand how social ecological systems work. For a company, which is supposed to be in the market and in the competitive environment is something new, learning the way of uh, working of social ecological system. Going far away behind the boundaries is not about purchasing, it's about cultivating durum wheat and how this knowledge can be accessed and developed. Of course, you need to have field studies understanding the local agro-social ecological system, so the communities, condition different from north and south of Italy, for example, and select the farmer for starting practicing these new options. And in the very end, we have these two boxes. On the one hand, you need to uncover and rethrive the traditional and ecological knowledge about rotation that has totally expired right now. And on the other hand, matching this with new knowledge about science of social ecological system and technical knowledge, for example, these technological devices they can apply for improving the productivity. That's it. Uh, sorry for um, uh, maybe running a little bit out of time. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, pasta and food are a basic issue for an Italian. That's why I'm talking about that. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much.